I saw the car on TV. They did the Filthy Rich Guide, and they brought you into his museum, and he had all these crazy motorcycles and this really cool car collection. And I saw the Alpa. We were laying in bed just talking about the car. We are seeing on TV with this cool guy. And, I, and, and I, I said to my girlfriend, I said, I want that car. I got to have that car. I was like, that guy's got a yellow, yellow Yalpa, you know? It's, it's unbelievable. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, Driven Podcast. I'm here with Michael Grabert with uh, Michael's Motor Cars and 1-800-CAR-CASH. Welcome to the podcast, Mike. Thank you for having me at the podcast. Cool. So tell me the difference between 1-800-CAR-CASH and Michael's Motor Cars. Uh, let's see. Uh, car cash is just a car buying service. We don't sell cars. Just a convenient way to sell your vehicle. Been around since 1977. And uh, Michael's Motor Cars is a pre-owned automotive dealership with a service center and detail center. And we sell cars, service cars, clean cars, and pretty much been a solid uh, dealership in the community for 27 years. Tell me how you got into this business. From the day one, uh, I've been a car junkie. Had a bunch of Matchbox cars when I was a kid. That was pretty much all we could afford, but uh, I also had posters on my walls and uh, I had a passion for cars. No one in my family was in the car business. Um, just years later, 15 years old, I bought a car and you know, had no license, fixed it up, cleaned it, drove it with no license, loved it. And then I put it on my mother's front lawn and I sold it. And I sold it for a double of what I paid for it, which was pretty cool. Um, the next day I was uh, looking for two more cars with that money and uh, Away it went. Uh, quit high school after that. Didn't really want to go to school anymore. Wanted to sell cars and be an entrepreneur. And uh, that's pretty much where I started. Um, as a kid, I was a paper boy. I worked in a gas station. I was a bus boy. I had uh, every job. I was constantly hustling, looking for money. But uh, cars were my passion. I loved them. I, uh, I had a bunch of Mustangs. That's pretty much where I really started with like the high performance cars. Every kid had Mustangs in like the 87 to 89, you know, in that time frame. Fox body. Fox body. Yeah, I still have one. And um, I loved Mustangs, and uh, I put an ad in the paper that said, I buy Mustangs. And that was it. I was 17. I just wanted to buy your Mustang, and I was buying them for no nothing, you know, at the time. Most kids got the DWIs, and their parents took the car away and put it in the, in the paper, and, and, uh, or they called me, and that's, what I, that's pretty much where I started, buying and selling Mustangs uh, out of the house. Super young then. Yeah, I was like 17, man. It was it was crazy, you know. I was living in my mother's house, didn't go to school. I went to night school, got my GED just to make my mother happy. But uh, where'd you grow up? Um, I grew up in West Orange. Okay. Yep. Essex so West County. West Orange, New Jersey. Yep, Essex County. Uh, whole family's from Newark. Uh, I lived in Irvington until I was 10, but uh, you know, I spent my teens in West Orange and a uh, wonderful place to grow up. And uh, yeah, it just went from there. It's been cars ever since, nonstop. So Jersey kid all your life. Jersey kid all my life. Love Jersey. Cool. What came I, first, like the uh, Michael's Motor Cars? Yeah, the car yeah, cars? Michael's Motor Cars. That was, you know, that was, I started that in 96. Um, you know, I was 20 years old. Um, I had a son when I was 19. So, uh, you know, I had uh, um, uh, a, a bit of a head start, you know, quickly as far as I had a kid. I had to make money. I had to, to make it happen. I was living in my mother's basement with my girlfriend and my kid. You know, it was crazy. Yeah, fast. yeah, I had to go really, really quick. I was hustling, buying and selling cars. I got a job uh, working for these guys in Patterson, selling cars. Um, young guys, they were awesome. Um, the place called Imports Auto Sales. And they uh, pretty much took me under their wing. They basically told me they couldn't afford to pay me, but they would teach me. And, and these two brothers, they were Syrian guys, they're, they're amazing guys. And uh, I said, I'll work for free, just teach me. Buy me lunch and give me a car to drive. <laughs> and that's what they did, you know? And, and yeah, they, 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 they were my mentors and, um, you know, especially the one brother really took me under his wing and just taught me, taught me, taught me. And, uh, you know, eventually I was like running the whole show and uh, things were, you know, going pretty good. I'm 20 years old, and uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, I, I, I said, all right, I'm gonna branch out on my own. How do I do this? How do I, how do I buy and sell cars legally? You know, so uh, I had gotten a dealer license. I had rented a little little office for like 400 bucks a month. So I had an address. I got motor vehicle to give me a license. I started Michael's Motor Cars. My son was one. And, uh, and I got a license. I was able to go to auctions and, and, and buy and sell cars. And, and I was doing it out of the house, out of the driveway. 
And I did them out of the driveway for many years. Back then, things were different. Um, there weren't a ton of laws. And uh, that's pretty much where I started. Um, and then eventually, I had rented a small car lot down the shore. And then I, after that, I got a, a very nice lot in, uh, in Neptune City, where, which I uh, still have now. That's, you know, 20-something years later. But um, that's pretty much Michael's Motor Cars. Um, you know, after so many years, I branched out. I bought the dealership across the street. And, uh, and I opened up a service center, Michael's Expert Auto Service Center, and I opened up a detail center down the street, so I was able to conquer you know, the, the, the aspects of getting the cars ready, and, and instead of giving the money away to everyone else, I was doing everything in-house. So, um, but my roots, um, I did get a job as a buyer back in the day, and the guy took me to a place in Manhattan called Car Cash, which everyone knew of. It was on Howard Stern, and it was around... Um, since 1977, and it was just a car buying service. It was a really cool place with a bunch of crazy guys. I mean, it, it, it could have been a TV show. It was a crazy, crazy place in Manhattan. And I used to go there every single day and buy cars. And I, we had a payphone, and everybody jumped on the payphone, and they called other dealers and to, to try to hustle the cars. And we made like a hundred or two hundred a car. So this is like beeper days or pre beeper days. This was like beeper days. <laughs> yeah, this was you know you know uh, I had Michael's motor cars. You know I had my license. I found this place. It was uh, you know a place to get cars. So um, I drove to Manhattan every single day and. I became very tight with the family that owned the place. They were amazing people. The owner was, uh, he passed away, but he was an amazing guy. He was a, a mentor in my life, Bruce Barron. And, um, and I was very close to this man. He was like a father to me. He loved me. I loved him. And, and I was like his star buyer. And they used to call me the kid because I was very strong. I had a lot of people in my Rolodex. I had a lot of numbers to call. And I could get any car sold. So I was very strong. A lot of these old guys couldn't get it done, and I was getting it done every day. So the owner of the place loved me, and we became like you know very very close over the years, and um, and over the, as time went on, that was you know a, a huge part of my life because I was able to obtain all these vehicles without going to the auction, and uh, in a, in a 2012 he passed away. His kids took over the business, and. Somehow, my, my best friend who was buying for me at the time, who actually manages all my stores right now, William, the closest friend in the world, he's like my brother, he pretty much said, hey, I think maybe you should make these kids an offer and buy the rights to open a car cash in New Jersey because they never did it. The father passed away. They were, they were having some financial issues at the time, and uh, it all aligned. I made them an offer. We worked on a deal. They sold me the rights to, to the 1-800 car cash brand. Um, they let me be a franchisee and basically take the state of New Jersey, um, which is all that I wanted. Right. You know, So just give me the rights to, to, to use your name, your phone number, and, and, and your web address in New Jersey. And I promised to uh, you know, open up a, a store and be successful and follow all the guidelines and stuff like that. So, sure. so it really worked out great. And obviously since then I have opened up three 1-800 car cash locations in New Jersey. And um, where are those locations? One in Hasbrook Heights, one in East Brunswick, and one in Toms River. Um, we buy a lot of cars. We do over 5,000 cars a year. So you um, got the whole state covered pretty much. Pretty much got the whole state covered, you know, Pretty much, um, but yeah, we're 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 you know the convenient, easy way to sell your car. We have the trusted um, brand name of of Car Cash, and um, it's been working out. I mean, again, you know, a lot of cars we we only buy, we don't sell, so we're not uh, you know work you know raising prices or changing numbers on people. We're very fair. They come in, they get a quote online, they sell the car, they're in out in twenty minutes. So. And also have a way to get some good inventory for Michael's motor cars. It's perfect. Yeah, it's avoid uh, the auctions, just like you did with the 800 car cash days. Yep, yep. Avoid the auctions. Avoid bidding against some other people. I, I mean, I still wholesale so many cars. You know, we do over 100 cars a week, every week. Um, and I pick and choose a couple. You know, prime pieces that work for me over at Michael's uh, motor cars. So it it all works out. And I have the service center and detail center. So everything together in one works, you know, I have my own body shop, we have my own tow truck, so it all stays in-house. So you built your whole ecosystem. Pretty much, just to cover everything I have my entire system where I, I don't need an auction, I don't need any outsiders, I don't need to any other vendors. I pretty much do it all in-house, so nice. it's great. I also want to take it back to, um, we are acquiring all these cars wholesale and everything. That's kind of how like this collection came into being, correct? 
Pretty much. Um, pretty much. Well, I'll tell you, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a car junkie. I live and breathe cars. I don't even sleep at night. I'm up on, you know, on eBay and bring a trailer and all these crazy websites every day, uh, researching, learning. And uh, I've had a passion for cars uh, for a long time. I had a Ferrari when my son was little. I you know, bought my first Ferrari. It was a 308. And I was in the club. I had a 308. I had a Ferrari. Didn't matter if you had a million dollar Ferrari. I had a twenty nine thousand five hundred dollar Ferrari. But I was in the club. You're in the club, baby. I was in the club. <laughs> took my son for bagels every every Sunday morning. Um, you know, in the Ferrari, and we were cool. You know, we we had a car. So I got in there, and then from there forward, I was on the hunt. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have enough capital. To, to obtain everything that, that I have now, obviously. But um, it was a slow process. Over years, I would get one. And once I got one and I made it there, even if it was not in the best condition or I got a deal or something happened, um, I was pretty much off to looking for the next one and figuring out a way to make enough money to, to support it Jeez. and get it. On to the next one. Yeah, on to the next <laughs> one. Um, but, you know, I've been collecting for, for quite some time. And, uh, you know, I'm up to like 40 six cars right now nice do you have a favorite in your collection i got a couple yeah there's like five that i that i, I love but yeah there's a bmw behind me that's probably my favorite car okay 85 85 m6 it's hiding in the corner it's a m635 csi uh it's a european model um they didn't bring that model here till 86 um the owner of that car had bought it in 85 in germany and he had shipped it here it's got 15,000 miles on it um, and a guy I know had found me that car and a Ferrari. The guy said I had to buy them both uh, to get them. I didn't want the Ferrari. It was a Mondial T, but I bought it anyway. I got them really, really good price on both. Um, and I just sold the Mondial T last year. It finally appreciated to a, to a significant number. Um, nobody really likes that car, but it was a rare car. They only, they only brought money on it. They only brought 43 of them into the country. I actually made... So much money on it that I got that one back there for free, and I still made a profit. Give me some of that. So, <laughs> um, and that one's got 15,000 miles. It's black on black, and it's just, it's just a really hard car to find in this condition. Um, and I had one when I worked for Imports Auto Sales back in the day, and it was like a 200,000-mile piece of crap one. But I did have one when my son was little, and I loved it, but it was, you know, it was just not a good one. Sure. This is like the best of the best. Right. And um, I probably won't ever part with it, you know. And my son will probably part with it someday when I'm gone, but I personally won't part with it. It's probably one of my favorite sure. cars. And uh, you know, I, have, I, have, I have a lot of cars, a whole bunch of favorites, um, but uh, we can go through them all. Yeah, totally. <laughs> all that are here. this boat tail right here. This, this thing is crazy. This, this is not something you see every day. This is very special. It's an Auburn boat tail speedster from 1935. Um, they only made like 700 of them. Uh, Auburn, Indiana, uh, they came out with this car to compete with Rolls-Royce and Duesenberg. Mm. At the time, if you were very, very wealthy or you were a movie star, Clark Gable or Amelia Earhart, they had these cars or a you know, high-end doctor. Um, uh, use. Big money, yeah. big money. These cars were over $30,000 in 1935. Sure. Average price of a car was like 200. This one is an original Auburn chassis, which is unbelievable. It is registered titled as a 35 Auburn, um, but it is a resto mod. It is a full conversion. It's got ABS brakes in there. It's got a big 455 Olds, big block motor and uh, power steering. And the thing drives like a, like a newer age car. Um, I, I'm actually banned from a bunch of car shows because this car wins so many trophies that it's not fair to other car guys when they bring their cars because they, they give me best in show first place. I have trophies for this car that are like 10 feet high. I have them everywhere. So like a lot of lo the older guys, you know, who just, you know, they have that one car yes. in, you know, in their garage, that's their baby. And they bring it to a car show. They kind of don't like me for showing up in this. You handicap the whole series. I handicap, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I, I throw a wrench into things. So um, Red Bank especially, you know, they have the car show every July. The, the firehouse throws the sure, big car show. Sure. Um, yeah, I can't bring it back there. But uh, but it, it's, it's an amazing car. Uh, I was very lucky to get it. I got it many, many years ago. Um, and when I got it, I didn't have the money to buy it. My friend had found it. Um, and, and, and we had another mutual friend who had tons of money and he had a museum. So we had got it for him for his museum, but he promised that I could have it one day for what he paid for it. 
which was what? So I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> but, but years, years later, he said, hey, I got these guys in Europe that want the 35 Auburn, and um, I think I'm going to sell it. And I said, whoa, 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 easily you forget <laughs> that we had a conversation 15 years ago, and uh, you said, you know, I would get it first right. So he was a man of his word. So he said, all right, no problem. You can have it. 15 years later, gave it to me for what we had paid for it then. Um, but basically, he gets first right of refusal if I ever decide to sell it. And if he says no, and I do sell it, we got to split the profit. So that was the deal I made with him. He's a very, very close friend of mine. Um, he had a 250 car collection, and I helped him uh, purchase the majority of them and liquidate them at one point. So a uh, big time, big time guy. Um, so it, it has to kind of stay in the family. Um, but it, if you look at it, you know, you're not going to go see another one at a car show. Totally. Um, it's magnificent, and uh, it's just it's, it's just wonderful just to even stare at it. You know, it's an amazing car. So, See, that's what I love. Like you, you say, family right there, and that, that's one of the things I love about the car community. Like we know each other a little bit through like Red Bank Cars and Coffee. You know, we uh, we carouse around town in Red Bank and stuff like that. I just I really dig the sense of family that we have in town with the cars and coffee. Like this, community. it's all family. You oh. know, the car guys. Uh, I have literally a lot of stories about all of these cars that I could share, and uh, you know, the, the none of these cars in here were ever for sale. That's the crazy part. I, I acquired all these cars. Um, they were not for sale. They were, it's just the craziest story ever how I got each car. Okay. But yeah, there's some unique stories of how I got some of these cars. So give me like your top three, like unique stories from the collection in here. Um, well, um, the Yalpa right there, that's a Lamborghini Yalpa. It's an 88. Um, they only made 410 of these. Um, everyone knows the Yalpa because Rocky IV. Sylvester Stallone drove it uh, when his wife yelled at him down the stairs that he couldn't beat the, the, the Drago guy. <laughs> he jumped in his Yalpa and he drove through the tunnel listening to the song. So everyone knows the Yalpa. There was only 410 cars um, for the world, which is crazy. Um, not a fast car. It's like... 250 horsepower, it's like the slowest thing you ever drove in your life. But it sounds cool, and it looks really cool. Um, that car belonged to a guy named Alan Wilzig, which I don't know if you guys have ever heard of him, very famous philanthropist, um, him and his brother, um, big time guys. He's got a racetrack around his house up in upstate New York. He's a big social media guy. They have a hospital, Wilzig Hospital in Jersey City, he donated a hospital. These guys are, you know, top-notch guys. Um, I saw the car on TV. They did the Filthy Rich Guide, and they brought you into his museum, and he had all these crazy motorcycles and this really cool car collection, and I knew of him through a very close friend of mine who was a very close friend of his. And I saw the Yalpa, and uh, it, it caught my eye because it was yellow. You never see a yellow one. They just never. And I and, and I, I said to my girlfriend, I said, I said, I, I want that car. I gotta have that car. I was like, that guy's got a yellow yellow Yalpa, you know, it's it's unbelievable. And uh, you know, that was it. We were laying in bed just talking about the car, we're seeing on TV with this cool guy. And then in recent, then I guess a couple months later, his mother had passed away. He had reached out to his friend to help with uh, selling a couple of cars that belonged to the mother that were in like Florida and he couldn't get to, and they had reached out to me. And I was like, no problem, whatever it is. So I took care of a bunch of things for him. Okay. And then he called me a few months after that and said, hey, you know what? I'm going in a different direction in my life, and I'd like to sell off my Italian car collection. Um, I'm, you know, he was concentrating on race cars and guy, you look him up, he's, he's an unbelievable guy. He's, sure. Everyone knows this guy. And um, I went up to his farm with my son. He's at a farm in upstate New York with a real racetrack, like legit racetrack, like no one in the world has, which is actually like an OEM racetrack like that they have, okay. you know, cost whatever to build, you know, sure. he had to sue the town for 20 years to get it. And it's around his house. And I went up to his house and, you know, and he took me through his museum and said, listen, you got to buy them all. And I don't want them all. I don't want that one. Um, but I think. The Mondial before. Yeah. And one, and, and, one, and one of his was a Mondial, another Mondial. Okay. And uh, I figured out a way to buy them all um, and piece out the ones I didn't want and at least just get the one. 
you know, and, 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 and he had the car for years. This car has been in the Hamptons. They have a castle in the Hamptons. Everyone knows about these guys. And this car has been, everyone has seen this car. It's like a famous car, man. <laughs> and it's got no miles on it. It's only got 2,000 miles. Okay. It's like the lowest mileage like one. Cream pop. It's the lowest <laughs> mileage one in existence. Um, so, so I got the Alpa. And um, there was one other car he had that he wouldn't give up that I had to have, but he wouldn't sell it. But a couple of years later, he called me and said, hey, you want it? This is the number. And it happens to be the Lotus over there, which um, that Lotus is Hello. very rare. It's a Gallardo Orange. They only made four. Um, it is the final production in 2004. That was the last of the Esprit. It's a rare, rare uh, Esprit's been around forever. So that was the final edition V8 Turbo, Twin Turbo. Big wing in the back. V8 Twin Turbo Esprit. They made four, two of them with Chanel interior. That's one of the two with the Chanel interior. Okay. Um, got no miles on it, like 4,000 miles, uh, maybe five now. And um, it was like made for like the CEO of Lotus or something. I, I, I don't know the 100% of, of a, a big guy in Lotus. They, you know, gave him that car. So that was his car. And Alan said, I'm going to part with the Lotus. You know, it's magnificent. I tried to chop him on the price. He laughed and said, it's <laughs> this, take it or leave it. It's the nicest, coolest one in the world. And I said, you know what? I'll take it. Yeah. So, so I got both those cars from Alan Wilzig and uh, they were his, you know, personal cars and they're super, super rare. Um, the Lotus, I don't think I could ever part with it. Um, you show up at a car show in that car, uh, it's a, it's a Gallardo orange pearl. Mm -hmm. it, no one has one. Right. They only made four. Right. No one has that car. And it's, it's magnificent. It's got orange piping inside and, um, it's just really, really special. So again, these cars were never advertised for sale. Mm -hmm. They came to me. I got them, you know, very lucky to have them. Um, you know, I talk about cars like they're children, but these are my kids, you know, they're, 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 they're a part of me, some of these cars, so most of them. Your mentor's name before, you, I think you mentioned that 800 car cash was Bruce? Bruce Barron. Bruce Barron. Okay, like, the great thing about mentors is they help us develop as business people. Part of the Driven Podcast I really want to highlight is not just the cars that we drive, but also, like, the entrepreneurship element. And, like, paying forward those messages from our mentors, like, this is why I'm so successful today kind of thing. This yeah. guy was me 20 years ago, and and I, you know, I was in awe of this man. Sure. You know, good-looking guy, drove a Corvette, took a different car home every night, had this amazing business. Um, you know, just a, a wonderful guy, had every gadget in the world, cool as could be. But he was also the boss of this crazy operation, and everybody wanted in. And they had a very select group of people they let in. And... If you were one of those people, you were pretty much family there. And uh, literally, I mean, you couldn't just walk in there and buy cars. It didn't work that way. It was, it, you had to prove yourself. And there was only like 10 of us allowed in this place, this amazing place that had all the best cars. Sure. And they were all for wholesale. Um, so, you know, we had lunch every day. We, we, I learned the stock market. These guys were trading stocks on the phone with brokers. Well, it's you know, New York, right? It was New York City. Yeah. You know, it was, it was crazy. And it's it was, too. Yeah, it was like 1993, 95, man. It was like they had a pay phone. We had a line of guys. You know, we stood outside. Girls walked by. We so were, this is the Wolf of Wall Street era of freaking It was, New York. it was, it was. Which and is probably why it was so crazy then. It was crazy. So tell me the craziness. Like, you got stories from Wolf of Wall Street. What's 800 car cash crazy stories? We had an up system. The first guy who got there put his name on a board and he was able to have dibs on any car that was bought the night before. And the first car that came in that day would go to him. If he didn't buy it, he would pass it on to the next guy. Dibs. So we had a board and we kept a board because otherwise we would fight. And when I say fight, yeah. We had fist fights. Of course. Me and these older guys, we had fights because it was in there, crazy. <laughs> we needed that car. We needed the 200 or 100, a car that we were going to make. And that was how we earned a living. We didn't have the capital. So we weren't the big guys. We were just bodies. We were brokers. Mm -hmm. And we were in this freaking place, buying and selling cars, cutthroat business. True. And, you know, the car would come in. We would stand back. The customer would sell the car. And, you know, they would all be in the office doing their thing. And when the customer would leave, the plates would come off. That car was for sale. We were all hungry. We were all like, I need that car. I got a guy. Shark tank. We were all in the shark tank. <laughs> you know, we had an up system. We fought each other. But Bruce was the owner. 
And he was very nonchalant. He was very cool. Um, you know, wore a suit jacket every day, but jeans, you know, he smoked cigarettes. He was the coolest guy ever. You know, I was in awe of him. And, you know, he just basically said, all right, that car is 20 grand, whatever it was, that was the number. And I had a way of negotiating with him because he had a soft spot for me. He was an older Jewish man and we just, you know, he loved me. He really, he loved me because I had a little kid. Mm -hmm. I was a young hustler with a little kid. Um, I had no money at the time. I was just, you know, moving and shaking. But he genuinely loved me and everyone hated the fact that he loved me. He probably and saw a little of himself in you. He did. And he would let me in the office and no one else and order lunch. And we would eat lunch sitting on the comfortable couch and everybody would be standing out in the garage. And like the freaking kids in there <laughs> with the ball. Boss man, you know, and uh, they called me a kid. They hated my guts. They would slash my tires and key my cars and steal my sunglasses, and they put me through hell. But years later, when I bought car cash, they were all at my door begging, of course. begging <laughs> to buy cars from me. Um, you know, so it was, you know, it, it was good. But I met, a, I met a lot of amazing people, and 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 I honestly only got this far because of those relationships. Um, it, it's pretty much about who you know. And, and I met the right people, thank God, and they all brought me, you know, to where I am today. So I'm very thankful. Um, but, you know, he, he was a mentor, and I wanted to be like him. And, 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 I thought he, and I used to tell him, I said, maybe one day you'll let me open a car cash in New Jersey. And he would laugh because it was a joke. <laughs> yeah. You know, that so was... out of touch. Yeah, it was yeah. a joke, you know. And, and, and God rest his soul, the, the man passed away. He was an amazing guy. And, um, you know, it was, it was a hard blow to lose him. Everyone loved this guy. I mean, he was the man. Um, and, and, you know, I mean, just... The man, you know, and big mentor to me. Um, but now, you know, I'm in his shoes. I own the business that he created, mm -hmm. and he created it in 1977, you know, and he was working at like a Toyota dealership and figured out, you know, I'm going to open this place and we're going to buy cars. And car cash, is, is, car cash is a famous place. Everyone knows car cash. Growing up, I used to hear the commercials. All the yeah, time. Howard Stern. Yeah. Howard Stern put him on the map. They did a ton of advertising with him, and uh, everyone knows it. They know there's a jingle. I'm in love with those car cash guys. Everyone knows the jingle. Little kids sing the jingle, and it was a famous place because there was no internet. People drove from Connecticut, from from Trenton. They drove to car cash to sell their car, and they would you know get on a, a train or a bus or in a cab and and leave. And uh, back in the day in Manhattan, you know, people lived in buildings, they would lose their parking spot or they would sure. move. There was no way to sell your car unless you put an ad in the paper and they did all these crazy commercials of strangers coming to your house and taking <laughs> advantage of you or telling you to get in the trunk That's to it. check the dimensions and lock you in the trunk or, you know, they, all these calls in the middle of the night. So they focused on, you don't want to sell your car to a stranger, you know, because you think you're going to get more money. You go to car cash, 20 minutes, you're in and out. And, and uh, it was an amazing thing, and no one was doing it. They were the only game in town. So I was lucky. I was lucky to have been brought there by a certain individual who hired me. Um, and, and, you know, just luckily I got that job. And the guy brought me there and showed me the place because I wouldn't be here today. And, um, you know, he, he was a good mentor, and they were a good family. And I was very lucky that they, they, they sold me what they sold me. And, you know, I've been riding it out ever since. So. Good stuff. So, like with Bruce, like, do you think there's any key like takeaways from him as a mentor that like really stick out to you? A lot. There's yeah. the, the, I couldn't even get into it. I, there's yeah. so there's so much of it. Um, yeah, crazy thing, because I don't I don't believe in ghosts or I don't believe in you know all this stuff. I'm not that guy. Sure. Um, but you know, I'm not saying it's not true. But um, when he passed away, he left on his Facebook page. Um, his family had, was never able to get his password, so his Facebook is, you know, still going okay. to date. Uh, they were never able to get his Facebook. But when I started Car Cash, I finalized everything. Um, it was just the craziest thing ever. Uh, it, it's mind blowing, but it's true. And 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 this happened. Um, was home. I was creating the new Facebook page for Car Cash of New Jersey. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, my, my whole creating a Facebook, um, car cash. I don't think they, they might've had a Facebook or whatever, but the second I hit enter and popped up my page within about a minute, it popped up my first friend and it was Bruce Barron Boom. who had passed away yeah. and no one had access to his Facebook. Um, his family was blown away. It was yeah. just the craziest thing ever. Like, like right away. Boom. I got a friend. It was Bruce Barron. And it was just like, you know, it took me out. Um, you know, I called his son. I called his wife. You know, they were, you know, tears 
who um, passed through the torch. They were tears. They, they because they did not. They've never had access to his Facebook, um, and it was a minute. That was it. My first friend was him. The guy. It was just crazy. You know, it was a crazy story. Um, you know, believe it or not, but it's true. I believe it. <laughs> well, it's got to be inspired anyway, because the 800 car cash is pretty successful here in Jersey too. Yeah. Yep. Yep. You know, yeah. We see all the commercials all the time. Yeah. Like everywhere. Yeah. You're on the internet. You're on a television. You're I don't. On TV I don't shows. stop advertising. Um, and, and that's you know, I, I took that from him. You know, he was nonstop. We used to say, oh my God, what he spends on advertising, Howard Stern, all these people. <laughs> you know, he's on the radio. He's on every. He's billboards, all this stuff. But you got to be out there, and uh, and we're we're very successful. Obviously, we have a brand name that everyone knows. We have a trusted name, um, and our reviews are unbelievable. I mean, we, we we pride ourselves on making sure we get those reviews, and 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 we do the right thing by everybody. You can't please everybody. Um, you know, guys said, "Hey, I went there, and 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 I, and they gave me an offer. It was terrible. I went up the street, and they gave me double what I double." For the car, and it turned out the guy had a one hundred dollar junk, and someone else gave him two hundred, and I got a you know a bad review that he got double of what his car was worth. It was a scrap car, yeah. um, but but our reviews are, are stellar, so I, I constantly keep up with the commercials. I do thousands of commercials a year, and radio, and Billboard, and Google, and you know we, we do everything. Media. Yeah, social media. Um, we are constantly staying on top of everything that is changing. Um, to make sure that we're out there and we keep the business rolling along. So well, I think it's so cool that you had like that mythology from you know 1990s New York, you know learning on the phones like Wolf of Wall Street style, and now as a Gen X guy, like all grown up, there's like this whole new world of social media. Crazy. And you're still adapting. Of course, of course. I just have to get some young kids to help me now because <laughs> you know you got this Instagram and TikTok and you know YouTube and you know there's all this stuff going on that um, you know I'm not you know perfectly keen on doing. I have a Facebook. I know every single person that's on my Facebook. I don't you know yeah. have followers that I don't even know. Um, so, but everybody, you know, I got a million followers. You know, all these. People, in, you know, so I, I'm, I'm working on, you know, staying in front of everything quickly. I need to know what's going on and how to make sure I get that audience that's there. So, okay. constant. Well, that, that raises the question, like, where does Michael's car cat, like Michael's uh, motor cars and, and car catch go from here? <sighs> Just keep keep plugging away and keep going. Keep I mean, it's very hard right now. Everything is transparent. Um, everybody knows more than me. Or everybody because they have a phone and that's what they believe what do you mean 12,000 my car look there's one for 13 yeah. how could you offer me 12 this guy is you know so it's constantly I have a phone in my face sure. you know because the world is you know all about what they see in, sure. their, in their phone um, so obviously that has changed but um, we try to just give everybody a solid offer as far as the car buying goes they go out they research they try we tell them here's an offer it's good for seven days go see if you could do better and if you can Good luck yeah. to you. We wish you the luck. Sure. But please see the value in our service. Mm -hmm. At this number, you're in and out in 20 minutes. We pay off your loan. We pay off your lease. And it's over. You didn't sell it to your friend who's going to call you every time you know something breaks or whatnot. So, so I try to stay on top of you know, doing everything legitimately, honestly, giving everybody you know, the right to go explore and do what they have to do because they have their phone and they have a million options. Um, but, you know, and then as far as Michael's motor cars, all I can do is tell you, my product is great. Whatever that product is, whatever that car is, mm -hmm. I make sure I service it. I make sure it's ready to go. I make sure the tires are good. I make sure it's, you know, I would give it to someone in my family. I can't guarantee the future on a used car. Yeah. I tell everybody, buy a warranty. I don't know. Yeah. But I'll tell you today, this is a quality car. I've gone through this whole car. Back in the day, I didn't have service. We bought them, we sold them. They would break, they'd come back, I'd fix them, whatever the case may be. And, and that's another reason I'm so successful is um, I don't turn my back on anybody. I sell you a car, something happens, come back, we'll figure it out. I got a shop, I got mechanics, I have other cars. It's, we'll work it out. I can't have you at the bar screaming, Michael screwed me. I, you know, I got 27 years under my belt at Michael's Motor Cars with an A-plus rating with Better Business Bureaus. And, you know, now I'm being nominated Dealer of the Year uh, from uh, the Dealers Association. So that's years of good quality business. Um, so to me, it's just a car. So, if, you know, I can't get that emotional unless it's mine. Um, but but yeah, it's just a car and it's a machine and it could break and anything could happen. So, but you know, I just try to be as transparent as possible because at the end of the day, 
everybody knows everything. You got Carfax, you got reports, you can, you can. You know, everything's transparent. Now. Everything's transparent. You can find out anything. I tell my staff all the time, don't ever BS anybody. Mm -hmm. If you don't know the answer, you don't know the answer, you'll try to find out the answer. Mm -hmm. You can't guarantee the future. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. Don't, you don't have to talk anybody into anything. You don't have to sell anybody anything. That's right. They know what they're doing. They got all the information. They know every price, Kelly Blue Book, this, that. They know everything. So just run clean. Mm -hmm. And if you run clean, it all comes back, man. Well, look at the business. I mean, like, the connotation of the car business is it's shady, snake oil salesman, all Terrible. that kind of stuff. Like, I think that's why you're so successful is because it's grounded in business ethics. You do the right thing. You treat people like, you're, you know, they're your own family. Like, you have, you have to. There's so many, it. there's so many bad guys. There's that's so many the crazy success. stories. Um, I've been a member of the Better Business Bureau for so many years. Everybody says, oh, BBB, it's BS. But people do know it. They spend a fortune in advertising. Sure. And if you make a complaint to the BBB, the BBB will come to you and say, hey, you got a complaint. Yeah. How are you handling this? Yeah. And, and for me to keep that A-plus rating for all these years is not, I'm not going to say I never got a complaint. Of course. But it's how I handle the complaint. That's right. I don't go to court. I don't get into lawsuits. I, whatever the problem is, we work together. Sure. I can get an irate customer screaming that something happened to his used car mm -hmm. that he thought was a new car, but it's a used car. He says, I just bought it. It's only six months old. I'm like, sorry, it's 12 years. It's yeah. 12 years old. Right. And I didn't build it. So yeah. don't yell at me, but let me help you with your situation. I'm not going to just, you know, say here, here's 5,000 because your mechanic says it needs 5,000. Yeah. But you're going to bring it in and we're going to look at it together and we're going to figure it out and we're going to work together although you know and, and, if, and if you hate the car and it's we'll trade it we'll work it out so so i've been doing that my whole life well, and, business, conflict resolution. and it paid off i mean in 2012 we had a hurricane sandy and 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 right up to 2012 before the you know that was 10 years ago before the internet was so crazy <laughs> i was like the only game in town people used to say the lot with the good cars yeah. they used to always say oh that lot on 35 with the good cars mm -hmm. like they didn't even michaels they didn't know but they knew who I was, and I took care of all my customers so that when Sandy happened, it was boom. We lost every car in the driveway. My mother's car, my daughter's car, my wife's car. I need four cars. So, boom, Mike. Yeah. Hey, remember me? I bought the Buick two years ago and the, and, and the Caddy three years ago. Well, guess what? The, the storm wiped us. Yeah. Help. I have insurance money coming. So in, when Sandy happened was an insane opportunity for, for, for yeah. growth for me because... My entire neighborhood lost all their cars. Yeah. Everyone. I remember. I was in Bradley Beach at the time. Everything Everyone. Was water. We had a curfew back then. My lot, I knew the storm was coming. My lot, I don't know if you realize, my lot sits up on a hill. Yeah. It sits very, very elevated. Um, but my good friend who had this museum with all these cars and wall, he had so much room. I knew the storm was coming. I was very scared. And I said, I'm going to bring... A bunch of my cars there and we spent like an entire day just running the cars to the wall and put them in his building and i and, and whatever i had left was up at the top yeah. so the water had come up just to like i lost one car there was just one car a corvette that was a little low that the water went in yeah. um so i was able to save all my cars um and and i was able to go out to Mannheim to the auction with lists from all my customers Perfect. Of what they needed. Get Water me this, taken. get me that. And I was able to replace the entire neighborhood. I was able to grow because there wasn't a haggle on price. Back then, we were always making deals. And, you know, sure. they just said, get me these cars. Insurance we trust you. We trust you. Insurance is paying. I got to have these cars. And I had all these lists. And I spent about three months just, you know, buying a zillion cars and taking care of them. But, but luckily, they all knew me. They all trusted me. And I had the recognition in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I had all my customers, sure. you know. So um, not to say I don't have all my customers today because I still have a million repeat customers. But now with the Internet, everyone's got a million choices. Of they hit buttons and they buy cars, right. you know, and they see what they want. I'll take it and it gets dropped off and, you know, or whatever happens today. You know, I, I've obviously lost a lot, but I still sell cars all over the country and, you know, adapt and all that stuff. So, all good there. Cool. Good business. Good business. Now you just uh, built a new showroom, didn't you? Just built a new showroom. Yeah, I I had purchased the Stumpy's Yamaha dealership uh, right down the block. Um, that was in business 
since the 30s. And they were in that oh. location. Well, the, the, the Stump family, yeah, they, they okay. started with like Ducati and Indian, um, but they, they were in business for like almost 100 years. I never realized that. Yeah, they, that location was since 1956. Okay. They had started in North Jersey. So, so everyone knows Stumpy's Yamaha. They bought a motorcycle, a jet ski, something happened there. Um, and, and I've been growing and growing and growing over, over the years. And I have other lots. I have holding lots. I have cars everywhere. I have, I have tons of cars. But I, but I, but I didn't have a, a, an indoor showroom, which I always wanted, mm -hmm. because I wanted to be able to really showcase those, those prime cars that, that I went after. I have this place. This is my personal garage. Sure. You know, this, this I built, and this is just for me, and, and nothing ever is for sale in here. Right. Um, but, but, I, but I needed a showroom. I wanted a place. So um, I was driving with my son, Joe, and he said, hey, did you see Stumpy's going out of business? We were on our way to car cash one morning. And I said, what, what are you talking about? And he said, yeah, I saw him outside yesterday with spray paint going out of business. He wrote that. I saw it right down the window. Okay. And I was like, like, go on Facebook. See if they have a Facebook. Get in touch with someone right now. Like, find their social media. You know, he's looking them up. Stumpy. So you he's, knew immediately, I'm getting that place. I was, <laughs> and that's what I do with everything. Yeah. So, so everything I've ever bought was not for sale. Um, so, so I'll tell you, I'm driving and he said, that, you know, I think the mom has a Facebook. She's older, like in her eighties, Evelyn Stump. She's got a Facebook. I said, friend her, message her, find out what's going on right now, this second. And, and, and we went to car care. And a couple hours later, John, uh, John Stump, John Stumpies, he called me and he said, yeah, well, what's going on? You, you messaged my mother. Yeah, we're, we're done. We're done. We're shutting it down. We're done. I've had it with everybody. Little Johnny broke his arm. Nobody wants to buy a bike no more. Oh, right. You know, everyone's chopping me on price. They're trying to save $50. <laughs> and I'm only making 300 on these bikes now. I want out. And uh, I said, I can be there in an hour. And uh, I literally pedaled to the metal. I went there. Place was dilapidated, falling apart, disaster. Needed a ton of work. Um, and he said, yeah, well, the guy next door, I can go next door. He'll buy it from me. And always the guy next door will buy a property. So uh, I said, you're not selling it to the guy next door. I want it. I'll take it. He goes, well, there's something I got to tell you. I said, what's that? He says, well, there's a lot of problems with this property. I have some litigation with the town, and there's some issues that lie within the town of Neptune, and mm -hmm. there's, there's some problems that are going to come with it. You can't just open it up as anything. It right. can't be anything. Okay. It can only be Stumpy's Yamaha. The second you try to change it, there's going to be a, a big monetary issue and time issue. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it, and, and I said, you know what? Whatever it is, I'll overcome it. Sell me this property. Yeah. And the 36 hours to actually come to terms to make an agreement, bought the property without anyone knowing. And then boom, had to get an attorney, had to spend six figures just to fix his problems. Jesus. And then COVID. I bought it in I bought it in right. December of 19. I closed. It was great. I went on vacation. I came home. I got a lawyer. COVID happened. Everything stopped. I'm paying a mortgage. I got a dilapidated piece of property. You know, I wasn't even allowed to enter it, do anything with it. Um, but uh, we worked through it, and, uh, and, and I got everything turned around. Um, the township had to all come together to allow me to do what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. I had to go before the board, and, and they had to accept me as a person. And, mm -hmm. and they decided that if they were going to allow car sales, which weren't allowed there, okay. and they were going to allow me to change the use of the property, which they spent millions of dollars changing because they were going to have a developer put uh, condos there at one point, and that never happened. Yeah, yeah. So they spent millions of dollars to make sure no car dealer could ever go there. Wow. Um, so at the end of the day, the, all the people got up before the board, and there was like you know, a ton of people, and they said, hey, well, we all know who Michael is, even though I'm in Neptune City, not Neptune, different town. Um, but they said, we all know who Michael is, and if anyone is going to do it, at least we know this guy, yeah. let's give him some rules and some provisions, and we'll, we'll let him do it a certain way. Sure. So, so everyone got together, and they approved it, um, and I just renovated the whole place. Um, I don't know if you drove by it. Um, yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll have you come inside yeah, and really see what's going on here. And um, did a full renovation. You know, Everything is beautiful and clean, and, and it's a beautiful showroom, and you know, we're going to put some, some real high-end cars in there and do some quality photography and video sure. in there, um, amazing lighting, and you know, it's really set up very, very nice. And that's my baby right now. Mm -hmm. I'm uh, you know, hoping to get, open, get that open the next month or so, but it's, it's all ready to roll. So, uh, and, and that's going to be the Michaels Motor Cars exotic, 
classic showroom. You know, just the special cars. Well, Jewelry box. The good stuff. Yeah. The, you know, the, the 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 majority of the cars will get sold. You know, you know, by appointment only. The customer will see the pictures, see everything, make an appointment, come down, and it'll be sold in you know a second. Yeah, that's how I so, saw it. I saw on your Facebook like from like dilapidated stumpies to where it is now, and it's just an amazing transformation. Amazing transformation, and uh, it's great. It's right right next door to my detail center. Uh, there's uh, two doors down, and uh, you know, I live two doors down so you know I live in town everyone knows me they know everyone's very excited about the place because Stumpy's was an eyesore for a long time mm -hmm. and there was just a lot of bad blood with the Stumpy's name even though they're amazing people sure. and they had an amazing business for many many years they had some problems with some neighbors mm -hmm. with loud motorcycles of and course. jet skis yeah. and 18 wheelers dropping off you know all these pallets in the middle of Route 35 and causing traffic so it was kind of a nuisance for neighbors sure. Because it's just, I don't you know, if you know where it is, it's a tight spot right yeah. there. We used to um, store a jet ski service. Yeah, it's a very tight spot, and uh, they, they just had some unfortunate problems. Yeah. Um, but I have hopefully addressed, and everything is smooth sailing from here forward, and I'm going to be a good neighbor to everybody. So It's funny how everything works out, too, because you think about, like, Sandy, and how everybody needed new cars, and that, like, built goodwill in that complete area, and, like, now everybody wants help you out. You know, like yeah, it's great. I, I'll tell you, I started across the street from me. I don't know if you know that. You know where my dealership is. The yeah. lot there's a lot across the street. I know that one. Yeah. That sells very low end right. cars. Yeah. That was my first lot. Okay. And and I'll tell you how I found that lot. Um, next to Patrick's. Right next to Patrick. So okay. that that back in the day was owned by a guy named Charlie Walters, Ocean Auto Sales. Mm -hmm. The guy only sold Cadillacs. He was a class act. Everyone knew him. He had passed away well, many years ago, but sold it to a guy. The guy sold it to. Um, whatever, had a little operation. I had put an ad in the paper. I was desperate to rent a car lot. I had no lot. I was working out of my house. Um, this was in 1999. Okay. Um, I had put an ad in the paper, looking to rent a used car lot. Call me. Guy called me. Neptune City, where's that? I don't even know where that is. I had lived in Matawan at the time. Drove down to Neptune City. I met this uh, nice older gentleman and his son. They said, we'll rent you the place. I said, great. He said, well, we're going to keep the side. You're going to just get the front and this office. And... It's 2700 a month. I said, perfect, I'll take it. Yeah. He said, but, you know, I, I want money in a bag, cash, for the key. I'm going to sell you the key, yeah. not the property. You're just going to get this key, and there's two desks, and those desks are yours, and there's some chairs, yeah. and I need a bag of cash. And, you know, I said, I don't, you know, oh, God, here we go. So um, you got to give me Jersey time. Jersey style. Jersey style. I said, all right, you're going to have to give me time because I don't have that kind of money. And, uh, you know, so, so every week I went and gave him money, you know, thousand, whatever it was. I, sure. I gave him money. Sure. And uh, finally he gave me the key and he gave me a lease. And I had a car lot, like a real car lot, you know. Legit. Michael's motor, I was like legit. I had no money for cars. But I had a lot of friends that I made at Car Cash, wholesalers that gave me cars on consignment to get started. So I was able to fill the place up with like 20 cars and get cooking. Ha hired a friend of mine to come help me, and you know, no computers, or notebooks, and you know, that was it. And uh, that's where I had started originally. Um, and what happened was, I was into like the second year on my lease, and I remember reading the lease saying like you had to send the guy a letter to renew the lease, and it had to be like a certain date. And I sent the guy a letter, and um, it said, sir, sent certified. And he never signed for it. So, I, so he wouldn't sign for the certified letter. So then I saw him, and the guy loved me. I was like a son to him, he told me. He used to take me out you to dinner. You Yeah, he used to take me out <laughs> to dinner. And I said, hey, Harry, here's the, the letter. You know, I'm, I'm renewing the lease. He goes, sorry, kid. Can't renew the lease. And I just started a business, and yeah. I was growing. Everyone knew me, and I was like in it. I was moving and shaking, and I had a place full of cars. I had hot dog stands on the weekends and pony rides, and I was really thinking You're out of the box. The I was killing it. You know, everyone loved me. That's it. And, and I, was, I was doing great. And he goes, read your lease, kid. I can't renew it. You're late on the letter. And I said, no, I'm, no, I'm early. I'm early on the letter. I was like a week early. Yeah. And uh, he looked at me and goes, just, just read, your, read your lease. So I went home. I read the lease. I'm trying to figure out how was I late. And it, it turned out that he had shorted me two weeks in the lease. He had started the lease on like a 15th and ended it on a 1st. So you backdated it. Well, no. In the beginning, okay. he had shorted it by two weeks. It wasn't the full two oh, years okay. with the renewal. So I was a week late. I was a week late. And, and he looked at me and he goes, I love you like a son. And just so you know, this is nothing personal. This is just business. 
Your rent's 5000 a month now, kid. And I'll never forget it because I just got smacked at this crazy lesson from this old guy who Seriously. I thought was my friend. Um, but he was a smart, smart, yeah. smart guy. And he probably did this a million times in his life. Sure. Um, and now it's 5000 because he saw how successful I was. That's it. And him and his son were not that successful. They had like 10 cars and they told me the lot held 30 cars comfortably. But guess what? It held 70 because they never put 70. Right. And they didn't realize if you squeeze them in and park them a, a certain way, you could have 70, which made the place worth a lot more money. Sure. It's not a 30 car lot now. So, so basically I had no lease. I'm stuck with this guy. I'm paying 5000 Screwing me like... Never been screwed before. And he took spots away and really, you know, screwed and you me. you had all the other stuff going on, too. This was just all I had was this oh, lot. Okay, okay. This was I was small potatoes. I had this lot, and this was my whole life. Okay. All right, this little lot across the street. Um, the guy across the street from me, my lot now, was called Dawson Auto Sales. And Dawson Auto Sales was, he sold just regular cars, basic transportation, four-door escorts and whatnot. Sure. But he was there forever. And everyone knew him. And... Um, he was selling the property to his nephew, and his nephew was paying him off, and he was retiring. He had a brain issue where he was probably not going to live. And it turned out that the nephew was screwing him, and, and, and the nephew had some drug issues or was screwing him or something, and the nephew didn't come to work one day, and he went to work, and he found out that the nephew was stealing and he came across the street heated. I never even met the guy, but he was my competition. Of course, across the street, and he said... I just found out my nephew's been stealing. I have this brain issue. Do you want that place? I was like, yes, I want that place. Yeah. He goes, but I want you to buy the business. I want you to buy the Dawson name. It's a good name. It comes with all these banks for financing. It comes with all this stuff, floor plan. It comes, just take my business. I'll rent you a lot. I'll sell you the business, but I want a bag of money. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a bag. I gave him a check, <laughs> but he wanted a certain amount of money for the key again, key yeah. money, um, a lot of money. But the rent was cheap. Okay. And I said, you know what? I'll take it. So I made this cool move. So now I had Michaels and I had Dawson. So I had the two lot. No one knew, though, that I bought Dawson. Could it you? was still Dawson. Okay. So Ken Dawson, you know, became my uncle. So if anyone came looking for Ken Dawson, Uncle Ken's not here, but we're here. Yeah. And, and I took on his business, um, and I had all these banks and all this stuff that came with it. Um, but, but I had the Michaels going, I had the Dawson going, and I was getting screwed so bad by the guy that I said, you know what? I'm going to wrap up the Dawson name. I don't need it. I already made friends with all the banks. They'll, ba they'll back me at Michael's, and I'm going to move across the street. Mm. And um, I left that guy high and dry. I moved out, like, at yeah. night. Yeah. I had no lease. He was screwing me left and right. I moved across the street. I switched my license. I, got, uh, I closed down the Dawson name, and I became Michael's Motorcars across the street. That man went crazy. He tried to kill me. <laughs> um, eventually, he had passed away, right. and his daughter sold it to these other guys. And they've been selling lower end cars there for years. Mm -hmm. um, but when I needed more space and Michael's was growing, I had went across the street and approached the guys and said, hey, sell me this place. Yeah. And they said, not for sale, get the hell out of here. Right. So I left. Um, but I went back and I said, sell me this place. And they said, Michael, get the hell out of here. <laughs> then I realized I was out of room. I had no room. Right. I, 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 needed, I, needed, I needed this space. And um, then I went over there one last time, like six months later, and I said, you never even gave me a price. What kind of businessman are you? Yeah. Give me a price. Seriously. Give me a price. Yeah. Everyone's got a price. Yeah. But you got a week. And I left. Like six days later, he walked in my office with a little piece of paper, and he goes, here. And I said, good news. We're close. <laughs> you know, we were like 50 grand apart. So, so I ended up buying back my place years later, um, and then I, I had all types of plans to move in there and conquer that, but he had nowhere to go, and I felt bad for him. And I'd given him, and he thought he made the best deal of his life by selling it because he was going to go rent another place, sure. but he couldn't find another place. No. And then I kept feeling bad for him and, and stuff, and uh, finally he, he had nowhere to go, and I branched out, and I had a lot of other opportunities that came up. So I, I grabbed those opportunities and said, you know what, I'll just be a landlord. And I'll take over half the lot for storage, mm -hmm. which I needed. Right. And he's my tenant now. That's crazy, man. <laughs> so the guy who didn't want to sell you anything, get the hell out of here. He sold it you out feel to bad me. For him. 
I, he's my tenant. He's a good guy. I gave him a good lease. I felt bad. He couldn't get a place. He sold me his property, which he probably should have never done. I got a bargain on it. But um, it, 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 it was a steal of a lifetime for me. And, uh, and I have it. I still have the storage now for the cars. I got him and another tenant there. It has two dealerships on there. And uh, I was able to grab, you know, conquer the whole thing, you know. So that was a, another crazy story. But again, something that wasn't for sale. But I can see, like, the whole theme throughout your whole life is having that heart that you got. Like it pays off in business. Yeah, because, life, you know? because even after three years of me being in my lot, I had called Ken Dawson and said, hey, I've been paying you rent for three years. Enough's enough. Yeah. Sell me the property. Yeah. And he said, you know what? Okay. And he sold me the property, you know, for a very high price. A very high price. Of course. And once all the neighbors and everyone found out how much I paid because of public information, they yeah, came to me and said, you got some sad. You got, how could you pay that kind of money for that property? But... It was probably the best deal I ever got in my life, mm -hmm. that property, because Michael's Motor Cars has been paying rent to me for all these years, and I pretty much own the property for zero. And, uh, you know, it's my property, and, and I've been able to do whatever I wanted with it for all this time. So, yeah. so I made some good moves, some very good moves, um, based on the life lessons that I was taught by some very sure. not nice people. So, so it really worked out for me to have... Uh, to, to get that place and and now to have you know the Sumpies you know old place down the street and and own the property across the street um, you know and and it's a very nice area Neptune Neptune sure. City this is like a wonderful place yeah. to, to be and uh, it's just it all worked out good yeah you're down by the headliner and all that stuff yeah headliner's my next door neighbor yep yeah. they're they're very good there and uh, you know craziness goes on there in the summer but. That's it. You know, I'm not involved in that, but uh, yeah. all good. So, so I support some organizations. I do some fundraising. I'm actually doing a big fundraiser 5K there mm -hmm. uh, in August with the Neptune City Police Department. Cool. cool. So really good stuff. So we were talking before about um, you getting nominated for NIADA. Like, Correct. Tell me about that situation. Very, you know, very cool. Uh, nothing I've, I've ever thought about or went after. The National Independent Automotive Dealers Association is nominating me for Dealer of the Year, um, you know, for, for, for the nation. They're having a big convention. And What'd you do, man? I didn't do anything. I guess, uh, I guess just a bunch of, you know, uh, organizations and people came forward and, and pretty much said, let's take a good look at this guy. He's... Uh, Everyone knows him in Jersey, and he's, he's doing good business everywhere. And, you know, I have a lot of, I mean, I, I go to the auction every week. Everyone knows me at Mannheim. I sell, you know, 100 cars a week between Mannheim and ACV. And, you know, I'm just, I'm known out there. I do good business. I don't hurt nobody. Um, Better Business Bureau, there's a bunch of people that kind of just said, let's look at this guy, I believe. Um, so they called me um, and uh, said, hey, you know, we're, we're nominating you as dealer of the year. And come out to Las Vegas and, you know, and get this prestigious word for you know your your community services and all the things you do in the community again i do a lot of uh um donation work uh for the police department toys for tots i, I do a ton of stuff in the community um i try to give back whatever i can um canines for warriors the the the, the service dogs with, with the vet the vets they come back so I, i'm a big supporter of all this stuff so so basically they're 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 looking to give me this award or or not they nominated me for this award so um it should be pretty interesting right now they're going through you know all my background and all my stuff and doing their due diligence and uh um, you know, we'll see what happens. It's in June of next month in Vegas, and you know, and I guess it would be great to be recognized in, in you know, the whole country um, for, for, for good stuff that I've done. But uh, nothing I ever asked for went after, um, you know, it's just years of decent business. And goodwill, man. Goodwill. You put so much goodwill out there. I mean, that's a universe. It's karma, right? Yeah, That's I the mean, way I, think about it. I, 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 I do my best. Like I said, Neptune City, the police department, I'm very um, in with them. I am the chief of police, They're all my friends, and whatever they do, I support them because I'm a big law enforcement uh, supporter. Um, my best friend is uh, just retired as a captain who actually runs uh, all my car cash stores, and he's the one who got me car cash, and we've been together since we're little kids. So sure. I've been supporting him in law enforcement forever. Um, so just big. Big on police. And, uh, and also, I'm a dog lover. I live and breathe dogs. I have a beagle I just rescued. And um, I love dogs like crazy. So um, the Canines for Warriors is like really intense stuff. So um, I do a ton of fundraising for them. And um, just an amazing organization. So that's, you know, 
all the good deeds, you know, just trying to do some good deeds, if I can, you know, whatever I can do, if I can do it, um, the Toys for Tots, you know, we, we clean up every toy in, in, in Walgreens right before Christmas. I go there with my guys in the trucks and we buy every toy. I have videos of us every, empty the entire shelves. Um, and with uh, the Marines and Neptune City, we give back all the toys, we do it every year. So, you know, it's, it's something good to do. And, uh, you know, if you can do it, you know, I mean, there's very wealthy people that donate hospitals and <laughs> do all types of really totally. serious stuff, um, but uh, do the best I can with that. So, so it's cool that they, they're recognizing me and, well, you know, nominating me for this award. So it's good stuff. We'll see what happens. Congratulations, man. Just Thank on you. the nomination. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's cool. So I think this is pretty much going to wrap up the, uh, the situation here. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody for joining the, uh, the Driven Podcast. Um, Michael. Really appreciate your time. Pleasure, man. pleasure talking it's been to you. Awesome. Uh, really, thank you. You guys are great. I'll see you at Cars and Coffee. You will see me at uh, yes. At if, the Aston if you wake there. up early on a Sunday morning, you will find me at a Cars and Coffee somewhere <laughs> with one of these cars That's for it. sure. Cool. So good nice stuff. Time. Good stuff. Appreciate you.